reintroduce Seema, Seema Mulhotra MP, to chair our second plenary session, looking at the vital issue of jobs, how we meet the challenges for our aviation communities so that we grow opportunity, skills and employment. Seema. I was just going to share a story about how this morning a school had phoned me up uh, and was talking about the work that they were doing to support parents losing their jobs. And this is, um, and it reminded me that this is an issue in which we're all on the front line. Um, and I think that's important as to how we all have a role to play in the community for those that we see maybe have lost their jobs or maybe looking to have a way in which they've got an opportunity uh, to reskill. So we are going to hear from our panel about what they have seen on the ground, about the impact of COVID-19 on employment and income and their thoughts about how we respond. What do we need to do to save the jobs that we can, to create the good jobs that we need? Uh, and what do we need to do differently? And how can the creation of an ambitious, world-leading West London Innovation District, a Silicon Valley for aviation, seek to grow opportunities for residents and employees in the area? Now, to, to answer these questions, some of these questions and more, I'm delighted to welcome our panel. And I will start with uh, David Blunkett. Lord David Blunkett um, is well known, I think, to all of us, and he is chair of the Heathrow Local Recovery Forum. Uh, David, you've been a former Secretary of State for Education. You've chaired the Heathrow Skills Forum. You've this, uh, before and this summer, you've uh, chaired the um, Heathrow Recovery um, Local Forum. There's a report that's also just been published with some of those findings. In your opening remarks, it would be great to hear from you about what you think needs to happen to meet the skills challenge for aviation communities and to grow employment. Okay, Continue, good. David. Well, firstly, thank you for the invitation. And we have together an enormous challenge. I think the first thing I've learned is that we're not going to manage any, any of this without collaboration. It's going to take everyone working together. I know from having been in this afternoon, including uh, the recent breakout with Vanya Senna, who uh, is the Professor of Entrepreneurship at my own university of Sheffield, at the management school, that we are going to need that creativity and entrepreneurship. I've also, if you don't mind me saying so, Seema, heard some very interesting commentary, and I don't want to repeat it, but some things which I would like to challenge very strongly. I think there's a belief that somehow everything around us is going to be different. I think people are quite desperate to get back to the old normal rather than the new. And I don't think we should presume that the world out there is full of people who are overwhelmed by the concept of technology. For many, it means losing their jobs. For many, they don't have the connectivity, they don't have the, uh, the home, uh, and they don't have the expertise. So there's a big challenge of change ahead of us in terms of helping people through the immediate crisis. And for them, it is a crisis because this is about people and communities. Uh, and it's about people who, in the case of Heathrow, families, whole families, different aspects of the Heathrow family and beyond the supply chain, losing their jobs. So I think a step back for a moment and say, what is it we're trying to achieve immediately? And the, um, the, the, first step of the recovery plan, because it is only a first step, is very much about that skill, reskilling and skill agenda. It's about actually looking to ways in which people might be seconded uh, to other jobs temporarily, because we have to retain capacity. Uh, it's about actually being able to say, what can we do to ensure that those who had fairly menial jobs will be able to cope with the new robotics and artificial intelligence, which again will be a, a major challenge because change is a major challenge. And how we can then come to terms with getting the messages across about climate change and the fact that aviation isn't the enemy of climate change. Out there, there's an enormous, uh, and particularly through the, the media in Britain, an enormous wave of anti-aviation, anti flying, anti-airports, failing completely to understand uh, that a very large proportion of our freight comes uh, out from and into our major airports. In the case of Heathrow, I, I didn't hear anybody repeat this, but forgive me if I am telling you to suck eggs. I mean, 40% of the non-European freight 
uh, for going through Heathrow, 94% of it in the belly of, uh, of aircraft carrying passengers. The two go hand in hand. So retaining capacity, uh, retaining the, uh, the skills we need for the, uh, for the airport and everything beyond it. Uh, working with communities, that's local government, that's the local enterprise partnerships, that's the uh, business groups and the chambers of commerce, that's actually working with uh, the colleges and universities. Th those are the people we've been pulling together and it's their voices and their commitment that will make all the difference. And I don't think it will be even, and I hope John Holland Kay will forgive me for saying so, that those of us who are trying to help by pulling people together, it will be the enterprise of those who see an opportunity in this calamity and are prepared to take it, but above all, that people are prepared to pull together in partnership uh, in preparation for uh, the recovery, which will come. Uh, it will come faster once we've got the vaccine and the testing regimes up and running. But in the meantime, it's about survival. So I just want to say two things uh, about, about this. Firstly, the positive message has to be that people will be flying. I think that John's probably right, that it will be long distance travel that will recover first. But believe me, I think people will wanna go on holiday. I don't think they will want to be on Zoom and Teams all the time. In the breakout group, I heard someone from the States, uh, an academic suggesting that students uh, I actually like uh, seminars and lectures online. My experience is they don't. Uh, they prefer to be face to face because we learn together, we work together best, we innovate when we're together. I think it will be obviously a mixture, a collaboration of the use of technology. And there are people pushing the technology because it's in their interest to do so. But for many people, it will be a mix of being able to adapt and adopt the new, but wanting to go back to some of the best of the old. And uh, I just think. Sometimes we've got to sort out the bullshit from the reality. And the reality on the ground now is about people who don't know in January whether they'll be able to put food on the table. And that's why the innovation hub, the innovation district is crucial, not for theory, not for highfalutin ideas about how the world's gonna change and we won't, we won't all need to travel. This is about the reality of people having a job of the future. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for um, that very helpful opening remarks. And I think the, the comment you made about the impact of technology and is it going to create jobs or is it going to take people's jobs? This was actually the subject of a debate on the future of work uh, this week in the House of Commons. And there are very strong arguments on both sides. I think the the experience is going to be how we mitigate the impacts where technology um, is having an impact on jobs, but how we're going to create opportunity and access where we can as well, where mm. there may be other new, new jobs that we don't really know yet. And hence part of the challenge um, uh, that I'm going to put to our next speaker as well, um, Tracy Oust, who is um, the principal of West Thames College. Um, Tracy, you've really been at the front line as well of a lot of the debate and conversation over the last um, six months in Hounslow, really looking at how um, uh, we've got to see our education institutions be supported to help with you know, not just young people, but also adult education. What is it that you're seeing in terms of local need and particularly also around the debate about what jobs there are going to be in the future? And how, how do you think we've had to... To, or how have you had to respond as the, as the college to the challenge of the pandemic? Thank you, Seema, for the introduction and also for the invitation to be part of the discussion today. I mean, in terms of what we're seeing at a very local level, clearly we're seeing the rising unemployment. Much of that is attached to youth unemployment with local residents who have been displaced, furloughed or lost their jobs who now require training. And that includes the reskilling, the upskilling, and for some, having to develop new sector specific skills. We've seen apprentices who have lost their jobs. Many of ours are in the logistics center, sector, sorry, and we've definitely felt the Heathrow impact. So many of our students look to Heathrow for their career paths, and many of their family and friends work at Heathrow. So it's had a really significant impact. What we've also seen is the real widening social divide that COVID-19 has created 
with those already facing barriers such as language barriers even further removed from the employment market or access to it as a result of things like digital poverty. And one of the real challenges is often the unemployed don't always know how to access the training or even what's available to help get to that, that next stage. So in terms of how we've had to respond to the challenges, I mean, a lot of activities already underway. We're continuing to deliver our pre-employment training, working with our local partners, Job Centre Plus, local employers and local chamber. We've increased the delivery of some of our essential skills programmes, so English, maths, ESOL, digital skills. We've set up sector-based work academies, so most recently one for the civil service. And there is a new one that's being developed, will be launched in January around logistics. We've engaged with the initiatives around Kickstart, we're in the process of setting up a youth hub in conjunction with Job Centre Plus at the college. And we've really had to adapt our curriculum and delivery to support those skills gaps, to look at where those job opportunities are and to do this via blended learning. And that, it, that in itself has brought some challenges, particularly for some of our ESOL adult learners. We're continuing to work with our employer advisory boards, albeit virtually. Um, and working with partners is absolutely crucial. And I have to say, it really feels like there is more of an appetite at present to collaborate. And at the moment, we're working with our West London principals, other West London principals, our HE partners, to look at how we can support the skills and training needed for those priority areas that we hear about construction, health, the green economy and digital. So in terms of, you know, what next? And we've heard a lot about today about the innovation district. I mean, we already work with employers and other partners, but we have to do more of this. We've got lots of really great examples and practice of where this works. But the challenge is how can we do this differently? How can we accelerate the rate of change and how can yeah. we scale it up? So we Brilliant. definitely need a joined up approach and an easier process so all parties can navigate and we can better align the skills that are needed with the training that's delivered to meet the jobs that are available and to support economic growth. And I have to say the proposal for the West London Innovation District is a real opportunity to respond effectively to those challenges. And it would enable us to find new ways in which partners can come together, whether that's business, industry, government, education, research, to support the innovation, the investment, the growth and the jobs. So I see this as a really exciting prospect and collaboration is absolutely key to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tracy. And that's um, uh, an incredibly helpful scene setter as well. And uh, neat, uh, neatly moves us on as well to, um, uh, to Kath Shaw. Uh, Kath Shaw, who's the Deputy CEO of Barnet Council and has been pivotal in the West London um, Alliance. Um, Kath, you've been helping lead the West London Alliance recovery work across local authorities. What do you think of the scale of this skills and jobs challenge that we face uh, how have you been working together and what do you think needs to happen next uh, thank you Seema um, I have to apologize we've had a power cut here so I'm lit only by the light of the screen which accounts for my slightly ghostly experience and I'm on 4g so I hope that the uh, the connection we can hear strong you enough um, <laughs> Thank you. OK, so um, the figures are stark. I think you have heard um, a lot from other speakers throughout, but we are facing an unprecedented challenge. We have 115,000 people across West London on out of work benefits, which is three times the level last year. In addition, at the end of August, there were 145,000 on furlough. That's over a quarter of a million people who are either out of work or vulnerable potentially to losing their jobs. And that's a new kind of challenge for West London. We've, we've always had poverty, we've always had pockets of deprivation, but it's typically been predominantly in-work poverty, which was solved by getting people onto higher skilled and more stable work. Um, this is a very different kind of challenge. And the idea that there aren't the jobs to go to at the moment is, is very new for us. There are two groups of people we're particularly worried about. Um, Tracy already mentioned young people um, in, in Hounslow, one in eight, 18 to 24 year olds currently out of work and being out of work when you're young can have lifelong and intergenerational impacts. The other group I think are, are perhaps even more of a challenge are older, lower skilled workers. They may well have been in very long term, very stable, low skilled employment. They've not had to look for work before. 
often from um, black asian and minority ethnic backgrounds they may have low confidence in the job market they possibly have poor english language skills so um very challenging for them kind of in terms of um, the emotional challenge of getting a job their confidence levels and so on as well as the kind of practical hard hard skill challenges that they face um, you asked about collaboration. I mean, luckily in West London, we do actually have quite a long and established track record of working together. Um, we have the West London Employment and Skills Board that brings together business, um, skills providers, higher and further education and the public sector. And that, um, that board is quite well established. And, and has kind of subgroups that represent the various different sectors. And so I think we've got the infrastructure which makes collaboration easy, which is a good place to start. Uh, and we have through that, that grouping and between the councils delivered quite a number of work-based and, and skills-based um, projects in the past that are sort of there to scale up. So I have been incredibly impressed with how everyone's come together in the face of a crisis. Um, they say crises are great for creativity. They are also fabulous for, for, for um, building coalitions and working together. And the, the kind of level of um, willingness to work together and support that's been made available to local authorities has been, has been wonderful to see. Um, we set out our proposals in the Build and Recover Plan. I can't see my clock, so I suspect I'm running over. Um, but I would just say three things very quickly. Uh, one is flexibility. There are a lot of funds that we could deploy more effectively if we were given freedom by um, government. John Holland Kay mentioned greater flexibility for employers about apprenticeships. We would extend that to the apprenticeship levy as a whole and say if it's unspent, give it to local areas to spend. We've talked about the Aviation Communities Fund. We've got lots of programmes we can scale up, like the Skills Escalator. And then very finally, I would say data. Government holds loads of data which would help us do our jobs better, which they don't currently share with us. Um, there is a huge job to, to understand what the jobs of the future are, what the competencies of the future are, and to make sure that uh, Tracy and her colleagues are able to meet those needs. And a lot of that data is available or is, exists but isn't available to us. So that would be a, a third ask. That's very helpful. Thank you, Catherine. That's very, um, very comprehensive. Uh, as well. I think the call for the Aviation Communities Fund, I think also um, was very well articulated by Niall um, at, the, at the start of the, the conference. I think the question of flexibility has come up repeatedly. Um, and I think is a definitely a message for us to take back um, into, into discussions. Um, and I think Tracy, we, with Tracy, we also had a meeting with the skills minister, particularly on adult education funding and flexibility. So um, certainly as with skills being a big part of the strand of work, I think for the innovation district to look to how we develop the skills for the future. This is um, you know, clearly a critical piece. Um, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, Diana. Um, Diana Holland, who I think most people will know, um, of course, is Assistant General Secretary for the Unite Union for Transport uh, and Food Sectors and Equalities. Now, Diana, unions play a huge role in reskilling and upskilling, working very much with industry, government and employers, union learn and other workplace initiatives. You've seen on the ground as well what's going on as unions are working closely at the front line um, and, and also seen the shorter and longer term skills challenge. What do you think is, isn't going as well as we need? And what do you think an innovation district could bring? On mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Good start. Uh, thanks very much, Seema. Um, really pleased to be here and also... I think to welcome the recognition of the importance in all these discussions of workers themselves playing a part in the future and the involvement of unions in that recognition. Um, we've had a threefold approach to the COVID-19 crisis of protecting and defending safety, jobs, and particularly decent jobs as the emphasis, and incomes and, and pay. And obviously the impact on aviation has been absolutely devastating and the impact on community and the Heathrow area in particular, but of, of course all aviation communities has been devastating. What we're wanting to say is that we need to of course address all of these short-term immediate issues, but to do so taking on board the longer term and medium term issues that need to be addressed. We have a blueprint for the future for aviation and it calls for support, but not just support, support with strings, because we need to be 
protecting and defending jobs and skills and sustainability because we do understand and recognize that if we don't take all these things on board, we won't have the future that we want. So Union uh, Unite's got union learning activities for a Heathrow hub, which are coming on stream right now and are due to be piloted in January and launched in, in March, which are about the skills, a recognition of the potential of skills of people that think of themselves and are described as unskilled, but also opportunities to retrain and move. So we have women into science and technology, young members opportunities for retraining and so on. However, we've also got the reality at the moment, as was mentioned earlier, of apprentices who've come to the end of their training and there is absolutely no job for them at the moment. So they will leave the country, move to other sectors, and an ageing workforce will not be replaced. So that is a key issue that we have to address and we, our hub will be looking at that. We've also got the issue of sustainability in aviation. We have an emissions register for our members to register exposure to diesel emissions. And we're working with employers, particularly in the Heathrow area to cut emissions. However, we find issues like our road haulage drivers saying, there's nowhere for us to wait and we aren't allowed to go into the airport site until a particular time. So we drive round. And that is, of course, completely illogical approach to the overall um, approach that we have. So I think on the ground there, there's something very practical that can be done, but also the day after World Toilet Day, perhaps to say facilities for drivers. <laughs> The final thing is uh, effective innovation. It can bring people together, and I will say, please, please ensure unions at the table. Um, and to mean that it's not about workers paying the price, it's about workers playing a part and having a proper role in the future. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. I think we were breaking up slightly, but we, we got, I think, pretty much everything uh, that you said. We'll keep an eye on that um, as we go forward. Delighted to introduce our next speaker, um, Sheldon He, who's a general manager UK and Ireland uh, at Singapore Airlines. Sheldon, I was fascinated to hear when we spoke about the work going on at, Air at Singapore Airlines to upskill your own workforce, thinking about the future. What do you um, think employers can do differently to prepare us for the future world of work? And how can the transportation industry and research bodies work better together? Thank you, Seema. And uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this important conference. Um, I would just firstly like to acknowledge the, the incredibly difficult challenges that many um, you know, industry are facing, including all of the workers as well within the industry. Um, I think to, to kick off, um, at Singapore Airlines, we, we do believe that um, partnership with the workforce and with our uh, teams are critical um, and have been critical to establishing ourselves as a customer service brand. And we've really come to realize that uh, this digital literacy uh, is ever more important and increasingly important, in, in fact, actually across all of our touch points. So it, it, I think that there used to be a perception that, well, you know, the, the frontline customer service roles are more face-to-face. -face. They don't really require that much interaction with technology, but we don't believe that's true. And even customer facing roles are requiring um, uh, greater awareness and, and utilization of digital tools in order to focus on seamless and increasingly important frictionless travel. At the same time, I think um, every individual member of staff um, is getting involved in the use of data and insights for personalized service so that we can ensure that customer's experience continues to be enhanced in spite of reduced physical interaction. And, and those are opportunities we, we firmly believe in. Um, over the last two years or so, we've um, begun a, a, a company-wide initiative all across the globe, so including in the UK, to try and level up um, all of our staff um, on digital literacy and, and on giving everyone the comfort level to play around with technology without feeling too threatened by it. So this comes in a whole range of different ways from you know, just being familiar with uh, everyday digital tools like Excel um, to more sophisticated uh, concepts like uh, 
office automation, agile learning or, or machine learning or data analytics, um, every person has an opportunity to play a part in that. And, and because of that, we believe that digital participation is for everyone within the, within the organization. I think we, we want participation and we believe that with participation, uh, companies can actually grow better, especially in aviation. So in 2019, we launched a digital innovation lab um, it has several um, key themes that we work on, one of which is a collaboration with startups around the world, including companies around the UK, um, but also under the same um, uh, auspices of the Innovation Lab, we actually invite internal staff, any, any staff actually across any um, division, any, any role of service to participate in proposing ideas and um, to pitch for funding. And if uh, ideas are interesting and, and are actually viable, we, we actually take those ideas forward to try and test those ideas in real life. Um, and examples of that, which we've implemented in recent times include you know, the digitization of onboard menus, introducing an online ordering service and various um, companion applications, which allow customers sitting on board to interact with the in-flight entertainment system without actually physically touching anything. Um, and, and I think those are opportunities where working with um, players within the ecosystem can really be very helpful. Uh, and those are areas I think that industry as a whole can continue to develop uh, with its leadership. Um, I just want to touch a little bit on, on the, the point that uh, uh, Lord Blunkett talked about, about uh, the, you know, the, the sense of normality and, and about how not everything will change. I think in our experience, um, we do see that customers are expressing that um, there is still a desire to travel. And I think there is definitely some hope there. Um, there's also a recognition that uh, it's not all about just digital skills. I think we've, in our experience, we've realized that a lot of our core skills, customer service, customer interactions have become very relevant in other parallel industries as well. So as a little bit of an example, in Singapore, um, 800 of our cabin crew were deployed um, to customer service and frontline facing roles uh, across hospitals, uh, customer care centers, public transportation services to encourage safe distancing and so on. Um, and, and they've actually made a, a very strong name of themselves and contributed tremendously um, in, in bringing their skills. Uh, and as a result of that experience, we've launched a, a Singapore Airlines Academy where we hope to actually market some of those skills um, to you know, businesses around the world. And, and that's an example of what we can do as a business to extend uh, the skills that we have as well. Another example is in catering. Um, so, you know, as I wrap up, you know, we've launched a, um, a recent experiment with a restaurant at 380, uh, restaurant 380 on the ground. Basically, we parked one of our aircraft. It didn't fly anywhere for environmental reasons, but we turned it into a pop-up restaurant. And lo and behold, it was uh, very, very incredibly well oversubscribed. Uh, and uh, I think it reflected a, a great desire of people to want to travel again. And, uh, and I think those allowed us to bring the same skills about catering, about delivering in-flight service to people on the ground and create a new revenue stream at the same time. So, so those are some of our experience. I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity. We as an industry just have to look for it. And I think we can make it happen. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Sheldon. Uh, I'm just checking, can people hear me? Um, yes. at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I mean, that was incredibly insightful. And I think a real a message about how employers might also look to do something differently uh, and how we might be able to share um, some very good initiatives and practice. Uh, it leads us very well onto our final speaker, Bill Boller, who's the partnership di Partnerships Director at West London Business for um, the Hounslow Creative Enterprise Zone. Uh, Bill, a big theme as part of the backdrop to this conference is also working across and between sectors in our place. Um, new synergies that we want to see, uh, the transferability of skills, breaking down those silos, diversifying our local economy. You've had some experience of this. What do you think we could do more and how can aviation be part of how we take off? Thank you, Seema. I think you're absolutely right. Working across sectors and finding new synergies is going to be key to the future. Um, I'm here to wave the flag for the creative industries. And one of those sectors, the TV and film sector, is a good example. Um, the TV and film and gaming sector, as we like to say, the screen industry, has been the one sector that was growing before COVID-19 and continued to grow during COVID-19. We found that the uh, 
in addition to the film studios and TV studios that we've always had, the new streaming companies with Disney, Amazon, and Netflix has just increased demand for content and for skills. And in that context, West London is indeed a important cluster, if you will, and center of activity for TV and film. From the film studios, from Ealing and across the borough, the talent that resides both in front of and behind the camera in West London, the corporate offices from Sky to Disney to Paramount to um, all the other ones, the innovation that's being driven in the digital gaming and TV world. And of course, it's all brought together by Heathrow, which makes West London an international attraction and important to the whole world. And so as an example of collaboration, recently there was the Aviation to Screen program, which was a collaboration between Heathrow, Pinewood, Screen Skills, DWP, and JCP to take former aviation workers who either come from Heathrow or airlines and retrain them to enter into the skills industry. And the reason I cite that as a great example is that that was something that was done as a response to a crisis. So when we talk about the future of West London and talk about what is possible, we'd love to see those collaborations. I would love to see nothing more than see John Holland Kay pick up the phone to the CEO of Sky, Jeremy Dolphin, say, hey, what are we doing about West London? How do we work together to promote skills and innovation? And maybe those are the kind of conversations that this kind of group and panel can help occur to foster those kind of collaborations, which are going to be key. Mm. Great, thanks very much. But we may be able to, at some point, ask the question about whether CEOs have picked up the phone and uh, and talk to each other about um, about what we can do together for for West London. Um, I was just looking in um, uh, in in the chat, and, and we did have one uh, one question. I wanted to expand it. It was from Sahita uh, Sahiti Shiva, uh, and it was talking about the digital curriculum being key and different ways in which there could be training courses through. Um, FE, um, uh, other qual other qualifications, uh, short specialist short courses. I think there's a very important um, point about how there's a sort of roadmap for um, for what skills do need to be um, to be developed or grown, and, and digital is one example. But how can we collaborate together on that roadmap so that there is you know a much more seamless journey um, uh, and easier access for people, you know, regardless of where they're coming from or, or um, and how they're, you know, how, and where they want to go next. So there's some co coordination and cohesion around, around the, um, the, the education offer. Um, I wonder if I might just sort of put that to, to David to start with. Well, firstly, Seema, we've got to persuade the Department for Education that they shouldn't be against short courses. They should be against short courses that don't go anywhere, that are fillers. And at the moment, they have a, a propensity to, to put all the ideas of short courses into one box. I think the idea, not just for those who have now lost their jobs, but those who remain on furlough, we should be able to offer uh, upskill training. And particularly, obviously, you, you focused on being able to use uh, the, the, the technology and uh, digitalization in a way that helps them both to return to the world of work in the jobs they had if they, if they remain, or to be able to switch onto longer term courses, which will obviously yield them with qualifications or accreditation. And if we could do that, just think imaginatively about how best to do that rather than everything being in rigid boxes. I'd rather have somebody who's on furlough or who's... Uh, in danger of, of languishing on universal credit actually on a course than I would have them simply at home. So I think we've got an opportunity here. If people will think imaginatively, the capacity, Tracy will want to comment on this, the capacity of the colleges to be able to deal with this is a, a major challenge. And we probably need to bring people here in who had those skills, give them some idea of pedagogy in terms of how to teach and then use the skills they have to teach others. Tracy, do you want to come in as well? 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, I think that's absolutely right in terms of what Lord Blunkett has said um, with the kind of challenges that education institutions face. I think the whole issue around funding flexibilities just reoccurs. Um, but I do think there's huge potential out there as well. And I know that, you know, just as an example within the college, you know, we've had, uh, we, we very recently employed someone who was previously a pilot who's been able to come into the college and we've, we've been able to utilize his skills to help support and develop. He hasn't taught before. We've helped him with that. So I think there is expertise out there that we do need to look at how you bring the outside in. And I think it's that joined up piece again about, you know, and as David has said, it's not about compartmentalizing things into boxes. It has to be much more open. And I think some kind of, you know, so, some kind of hub like we're talking about or district that we're talking about would enable us to bring those key people together to be able to look at the bigger picture and look at the different component parts. So I think for many of us, we see the part that's within our area and we might have a view of what's happening inside, but we don't always have the levers to effectively bring all those things together and ensure that what we are doing actually provides for the wider region and not just the immediate you know our own immediate areas. There's, there's certainly been a, a quite quite a lot of discussion about how we need new spaces um, that can help kind of bring bring people um, together, uh, but also about how we work across sectors. I, I want to bring um, first Kath and then Diana in on the next point, which has which has come up, which is about where there could be the you know key sectors that also help. Um, drive West London's uh, growth. I think it's come of, some of the work of the West London Alliance has been in, uh, critical for that. And I'm also just, um, uh, you know, just drawing that question on in the context of some of the discussion in the chat about the success of the aviation to screen um, uh, project that's been been going on. So, Kath, if I bring you in first, and then Diana. Thank you, Seema. And um, just to finish off the last point, the other thing I would add, um, I totally agree about short courses, but I would also add that accreditation is incredibly important. And um, I know the West London and Skills Board has been looking at some work about uh, portable accreditation and accreditation of vocational learning. And I think that becomes more important in the current climate. Um, in terms of sectors, obviously, we've already talked about the creative industries that are incredibly important for West London. Um, two others I would highlight, um, and, and one has been highlighted in, in, in various chats is, is green, um, green skills. And we do need to be a bit precise about what we mean by green skills, because some of them are very um, amenable to, to low skilled people learning them. There's, there's a huge amount of work uh, around construction, around um, sort of plumbing and heating that, that could be people can be trained into. Um, not not hugely easily, but comparatively easily, and that is in with, within the reach of many people that we can get going quite quickly. And then I think there are the sort of more sophisticated, perhaps higher end green skills that are also important. The other sector um, is, is health and social care. Um, that, that is absolutely growing. Um, you know, we even pre um, pre COVID, pre Brexit, we had huge demands on our social care system. Um, you know, they are jobs that you can come into at an entry level, but you can have a career in there is a, you know, a development pathway. Um, and absolutely, I think, you know, if, if we're in danger of losing some of those staff through Brexit, if we are um, needing uh, more support because of, of the pandemic and the restrictions on people moving between care homes, there is a huge opportunity to introduce a new gener generation of people to social care that could be incredibly valuable for them and for us. We hear you, Diana? Oh, do you want me to come back? Yes. Uh, yes, um, if I can just uh, add another message to the Department for Education, don't cut union learning, because I think one of the great roles of union learning has been to bring generations of people who'd been left behind by education earlier in life back into learning in a confident way, because sometimes offering the course is step two, getting into an environment where you feel after years and years of not being in an, in an educational setting to start retraining or learning new things is a massive barrier. And I think that uh, that is something wherever you're going to go, that the union learning 
projects and, and the Heathrow hub that's developing here uh, will are absolutely critical to. I mean, I'm thinking particularly of women in their 50s who it was a huge proportion of those who've lost their jobs who um, have been cabin crew and won't be working in that area. It'll be very hard to see where they can go immediately. Um, I think the, the other issues that we've been trying to look at, uh, I mentioned aviation engineering apprentices, the food sector is obviously really important to West London um, and there is, there is the potential in the food engineering um, to look at, at things. But I think the, the message overall is that all of these industries go together. And the reason that you've got these very important businesses and head offices there is because they do interlink. So I think it's, it's vital that we don't find that aviation is being written off or that the jobs aren't protected in the short term in order to be able to rebuild effectively going forward. So I do think it's both things that we need, opportunities to retrain and move to other areas, but also protection now for those jobs and keeping people's skills and their recency up through the training that's offered while they're on job retention and so on. So there are really important links that we can have here. Siva, can I just say that I'm really on board with that. It's 20 years since we started the Union Learn Fund. I was very proud to be Secretary of State of Education and Employment when we did it. And governments of different persuasions have been prepared to support it. It would be a great, great loss if that disappeared just at the moment it's needed most. And thank you, David, for, um, for that. And I... Uh, I think it is a very important area. In fact, there was a debate in the House of Commons this week in which I spoke and described this as a policy where cutting that funding um, that has been supported by governments of different persuasions had no upside and only a downside. Um, and um, and I, so I very much hope that in the context of adult education, particularly that this will be looked at again. Um, I'm, I'm just going to now move as well to, um, uh, to, back to Sheldon and, and Bill, but I also just want to make mention of something that Diana raised, which was older workers, um, uh, which I'd like to just sort of come back to as well before the end of the session, because the needs are quite different. And there are some pretty startling statistics um, about, you know, those who almost 50 percent of people are not working uh, in the year before their retirement. Um, and um, and uh, some of that is you know, because of caring responsibilities or health reasons, but quite a lot is involuntary uh, um, inactivity in the labour market. Um, so it's definitely an area where we've got, you know, we've got to think about what works for different age groups as well and how are we creating opportunity. Um, but one thing that could happen at any age is, is being an entrepreneur and starting something new, often with maybe experience that you've had and applying it to um, you know, to different environments. And we're going to need to look to creating um, businesses as well that can then employ others. Um, so Sheldon and Bill, I want to come back to you because this issue about how we support entrepreneurship skills and entrepreneurial businesses to start, um, where, what could we do more? What, what have you seen that could be brought more into our area? Sheldon first. Thank you, Seema. Um, I think the one of the, the key learnings that we've had in, in the, the last couple of years has been the importance of um, industries players uh, within the industry to reconnect, actually, and, and look for opportunities to solve problems together. Um, so the I spoke earlier about the um, um, innovation or accelerator program that we've uh, we launched uh, some years ago. Uh, that actually allowed us to tap into communities from around the world, including um, quite a lot of the entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial talent here in the UK itself. Um, help solve problems not just for the aviation industry um, within the UK itself, but but potentially uh, across different parts of the world. Um, and I think the more opportunities there are to to tap into those uh, types of discussions or forums or platforms, I think the better it will be. I think it also touches a little bit on the opportunity with um, cross industry uh, experience that Bill talked about. Um, I, I think the, the, there was recently a, a project that uh, we did with Sky, actually, where we did a live broadcast on the plane using the uh, fairly limited bandwidth on the plane to, to actually connect to the studios in, in London, um, which was a, a first at the time. Um, and I think there's, there's quite a bit of an, an interesting learning there from the sort of opportunities that these types of um, experimentation and, and exploitation or, or pushing of the boundaries that could create 
um, potential opportunities for things like maybe even online gaming on board, you know, currently uh, very difficult to do with, with limited bandwidth. But um, again, you know, with interesting solutions, you, you can start to push the boundaries there as well. Thank you, Sheldon. Bill? Yeah, I, I think that West London has such great potential because it does have so many entrepreneurs. And, you know, I, I think it's hard to generalize, but I think in addition to the kind of support they need and can get, from business, from higher education and further education, as well as our incubators and accelerators. I think there's that real life element that a lot of our, a lot of our entrepreneurs and especially people of color need access to networks. You, you've got energy and you've got talent, but they need access and quote unquote, how to break in. And again, these are the people who have made commitments to try and start something or create something and want to be able to take it further. And it's just really trying to figure out how do we give them a leg up? Um, one of my old jobs, as they used to say, how do you help us get more customers? You know, how do we help them grow? And so I think that there's that element in addition to the traditional support infrastructure that we can talk about and always should be there. But I think I would add that they, they need access to networks as well as that kind of traditional support. That's um, a very, very helpful um, contribution insight. And I think when we talk about um, different communities and we talk about, if we think about the diversity of West London, um, uh, over 150 languages are spoken in Hounslow alone. And that is not unusual for a West London borough um, and indeed many London boroughs in other parts of the country. And so making sure that we have um, reaching out into different communities for, uh, as well is, in, is, is incredibly important. And many of our local small businesses are minority led businesses um, uh, as well. Um, I, I'm going, I know we're going to be needing to wrap up, and I, I, but I do just want to say I think that's going to be a very important strand of how we support people who've got the ideas to become entrepreneurs and how we're going to use the opportunity of the innovation district um, and the work going on already at the CRL um, to help support network development. Um, uh, so, but before we... Um, before, think, do, before you do wrap up, could I just say personally how grateful I am and I'm sure everyone else for the enormous effort and time and commitment you put in, Seema, to making this work this afternoon and all those working with you. I think it's been a terrific effort and a, and a great uh, opportunity to bring people together. I'm very pleased to have been invited to contribute to it. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Well, uh, you've been on the steering group and you've helped make it happen. Um, but my final, um, I think I'm just finally, before I finish, I'm just hand over um, uh, to, um, I think, Kath, did you want to come in with one last comment on ESOL that we hadn't really covered? And then I'll be handing back to Christian. Thank you. No, oh, Seema, I think you covered it beautifully. Um, the point was just that we tend to think about ESOL as or English language skills as something for employees. Absolutely many of our entrepreneurs exist in our diverse communities and we should think of it as an entrepreneurial skill as well. That, that was it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your contributions to this session and I'll hand back over to Christian. Seema, thank you very much. I have to say, Lord Blunkett made me sit up at the beginning of that. He usefully wrenched me back into the real world. I mean, it's vital that we talk about blue skies and the economy of the future and how we collaborate, but we really can't lose sight of, of what we face right now. There's tens of thousands of jobs that are at risk. It, it is, as, as David Blunkett said, horrific. And uh, collaboration in the short term has to be, first off, about getting people back to where they were pre-pandemic, as he says. And I can hear clearly in that session that putting tailored support education slash training in places is, is a, a major part of, of that challenge. So a really important session. Thank you to everyone who took part. Now, I, I promised that we would look back at a summary of those earlier panel discussions. So here to bring that all together is Andrew Dakers. Uh, he's the chief executive of West London Business. He has co-chaired and played a critical role in driving the Blue Skies Conference and initiative. So well done to you, Andrew, as well. Um, over to you. This has been, I think, an extraordinary um, afternoon. Um, and I'd like to add my thanks for the energy and the insight that all our speakers and delegates have this afternoon's proceedings, um, as well as our conference partners for their backing um, and my team at West London Business with our white label colleagues um, for their um, support in managing the, log the logistics. Um, it's amazing what can be achieved when people of goodwill get together. So what are some of the headlines from today? Well, turning to the Miro Digital Board, running through the conference, um, I'm going to whisk you through some 
takeaways. And uh, um, you know, uh, bear with me whilst I share that screen. They are um, visible um, in all of our respective uh, um, home offices. Um, so highlights from the start of the day, looking, looking back, um, we heard from um, Robert Quartz, um, basically the good news that there is the development of a roadmap for aviation's uh, recovery in progress. Um, perhaps much more significantly for West London, um, that there is a global travel task force in which the UK is actually um, there to try and resolve the issue of testing, um, which we report um, in November. So I think we'll be watching that um, very, very closely. Um, we also heard um, from SEMA um, that, of course, this proposal for a West London um, innovation district will see us as part of a family of innovation districts um, in the wider um, UK. Um, from whom Andrew, can you just bring your your mouthpiece just a bit closer? It's just dropping out a tad. Okay, is that a bit better? Yes, that's a bit Fra better. Fra I think so. Yeah, crack on. Sorry. <laughs> so, turning to our um, our conversation, jumping around a bit, I'm going to turn to our conversation with um, John Holland K. Um, he was, I think, uh, open to this idea of an associate freeport. Um, the sta that status potentially being part of a market that could be developed with the um, local community, of course, again, needing um, government backing. Um, he highlighted how some of the facilities that grow um, aren't necessarily um, well master planned, that they've evolved in quite a piecemeal way over the years, um, and that improvements to that infrastructure need to happen with or without um, expansion. But he hugely emphasised um, the importance of getting a testing regime in place. I think he was optimistic looking forward to COP26 and the year ahead um, that international agreement um, to address carbon and aviation um, was possible, uh, that critical shift um, from kerosene to sustainable uh, fuels. Moving um, on to our um, future of aviation and global transport session, um, we had some um, Positive reflections that uh, decoupling of carbon emissions from growth um, is already underway and in, in progress, um, and that Heathrow, along with a number of partners, have been um, backed by Innovate UK in a future flight programme, which is um, just um, about to, to, to kick off. Um, we had the reflection um, that we could set ourselves the ambition um, to make flight carbon negative um, if we were to put away more carbon um, than we emit. So really raising our goals and ambitions there. Um, it, another panellist um, shared that urban air mobility um, is the new opportunity. Um, drones are already in action um, in West London. Um, it was observed by um, Julia Buckingham from Brunel um, that the UK is a world leader in research, 16% of the world's research output, um, and we need to crack on with converting um, that into local social impact and commercial benefit. Heathrow being the perfect place um, for an innovation district with all the ingredients um, there. Um, we also heard, um, I think, from one of our um, one, one of our delegates, um, the reflection of how critical it is to the effort um, that there's early and consistent identification of startup and emerging technologies um, to meet the challenges presented um, by carbon neutral requirements. As we got into the breakout sessions, there was obviously a much deeper dive um, into what all of this might mean. Um, highlights from the digital session, um, we heard from Fujitsu um, that uh, there's an opportunity um, to develop a um, transport-focused digital arena um, in West London. Um, Magway offered up the um, opportunity of a fundamentally new way to move goods around, um, of course, powered by electricity. Um, and we heard, I, I thought perhaps ra rather intriguingly, that even a dairy cow can now be part of the Internet of Things. Uh, there was also, of course, a reflection we heard from a few speakers today that, of course, aviation traffic patterns um, are going to change um, in, in future. Um, there was strong emphasis on the need for vendor involvement in education um, to ensure that technology is contextualized in the workplace um, in the education setting. Um, even the role of a truck driver um, will become much more customer focused 
i.e. new skills for everyone. Um, in the green session, um, we heard um, about uh, the cost of flying using hydrogen and potentially being um, financially competitive um, over using um, jet fuel um, in future. Um, we also um, heard about the work underway now at Cranfield um, to, to, to make that fueling of planes um, a, a reality. Um, and also um, some emphasis on the role of pilots being able to take action today um, in changing their behaviours to limit noise and pollution um, in the way that they use engines when they land and taxi. Fast forwarding to the global session, um, and uh, we heard reflections around the importance of the airport potentially thinking about it itself as a high street um, in, in the extent to which um, things have got to, to change. Our high streets, of course, very significantly disrupt, disrupted through these times. Um, the positive um, insight that logistics is now starting to embed itself in our um, local colleges um, and schools. Um, also, the thought that, that uh, the DIT um, could be providing more support for, for, for companies um, to, to crack on with, with, with exports um, for, for the first time. In our innovation session, the fourth and final of our break, breakouts, um, we heard, um, this is going to test my eyesight a bit, in fact, I might have, even have to, to zoom in, um, that uh, as an investor into West London, it was important that we had the investor voice around, around the table. Um, what's really tremendous about today um, is that uh, it helps ensure that London remains the centre of attention um, in the world as a centre for arts, entertainment um, and technology. There was also emphasis on the role of human-centred design um, as we move forward with the development of a innovation district. Um, thinking about space um, and putting people first um, to create um, the right environment um, for sustained um, innovation. Um, and also in that session, White City was spotlighted, uh, one of my favourite uh, locations in West London as a massive transformation over the past 18 months. And finally, um, of course, in our recent session on future jobs, three takeaways, um, Lord Blunkett reflecting that not everyone's ready to embrace technology. It can feel like a threat um, to many people's jobs. Wonderful stories, I thought, from Singapore Airlines of the, in, in, the incentives for staff to innovate um, and the potential um, there for, for new connections with a, a local innovation um, system in, in West London. Um, and also a very strong message around um, short courses, that DFE really needs to embrace short courses and, and as an important um, ingredient um, moving forward. Um, in terms of how, how we're moving forward um, as a conference um, team, um, I think it's important to say some of you will have seen on the Miro board um, this diagram. It explains what's going to happen um, at our new home for the project, the CRL um, Accelerator in Hayes, where over the next few months, those of you that have signed up to our um, sort of de de stakeholder declaration of, of support and key conference partners, we will be working through with us um, the outcomes that we need to achieve critically um, from this innovation district that will then drive um, our collaboration um, moving forward. Um, our home, um, you can, uh, our new home, you can see behind me on the screen. This is what the CRL looks like if you haven't yet, uh, haven't yet visited um, Hayes. I'm going to sort of duck for a moment there. You can see the CRL brand be behind, behind me. Um, the CRL is home to robotic startup um, Bots and Us, amongst many others. And if you visited um, Heathrow's HQ um, last year, you might have seen their robots um, in, in, in trials. Anyway, um, that's it for me. Um, we've got an exciting um, few months ahead. Um, I'm looking forward to the hackathons, pitch days, and much else that will um, flow out of the Innovation District. Plenty to do, but back for now to you, Christian. That is quite incredible. I, I'm amazed how quickly you've pulled all that together. Who knew that stickies could be put together so neatly and comprehensively? Uh, just tell us, though, before I let you go, where if people want to look at that and look at it in more depth, how, how do they continue to do that? Absolutely. I think there's, there's a link that we shared beforehand, but we will certainly be repeating it, I'm sure, in the, in the chat um, window right now and also circulating it um, with, with the conference and the follow up papers. So it's out there for and um, to share with friends and family, too. Brilliant. Well, do take a look at that and, and do contribute to that. And Andrew, thank you so much um, to get your thoughts on all of those panel discussions that we've had. Um, we are thrilled to have with us as our next speaker, Jagoda Egerland from the OECD. And they've produced some really important research and reports recently on aviation and on what governments and nations can do to support a green recovery. Now, Yagoda is the advisor to the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum, 
at the OECD and the aviation policy lead for the organization. But prior to that, prior to taking up her role at the ITF, she was in charge of managing strategy and relationships with airlines at the UK Airports Commission. So you're going to, there's no one who knows the industry better than you. It's lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much for sparing us some time. I'll leave you to it. Thank you, Christian, for this very kind introduction. Uh, can you hear me and can you see me well? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, good evening from Paris. Uh, the OECD is very pleased to contribute to this very important conference. Uh, it's been a very interesting afternoon, and I hope that I can complement the discussion by adding a few post-its to the board discussed by Andrew and give you an overview of key um, recently published OECD reports um, and briefs on, a on aviation and COVID-19 and on making the green recovery work for jobs, income, and growth. After more than seven decades of nearly nonstop growth and the constant challenge to expand infrastructure to meet the rapidly rising demand, which has been an apparent challenge at Heathrow, the sector came to a global standstill. The recovery will be challenging and we need to work together to help the sector recover from the crisis. It's not, not only in the interest of the sector itself, but also in the interest of all of us. Aviation supports the movement of people, goods, investment, and ideas. Airports, particularly hub airports like Heathrow, create economic growth, jobs, and increase productivity. Our research recommendations look at how we can promote a sustainable trajectory for the aviation industry including seeing governments encourage investments in the green transition and thereby increase the long-term resilience of the aviation industry. For instance, by making firm level support decisions contingent on environmental improvements. We also concluded there is value in addressing sustainability along the whole aviation value chain. So including not only airlines, but also aircraft manufacturers, airports, and air navigation service providers. Aviation is an essential pillar of the tourism value chain, and the OECD work highlights the importance of better coordinating transport and tourism planning and operations for a sustainable recovery. This includes investment in infrastructure for safe and seamless travel, as well as improving the traveler experience, including by enhancing safety and security measures. And since coordination across sectors and with other policies is crucial, as we already heard today, policy responses to the COVID-19 crisis in the aviation industry should be integrated in the low carbon transition strategies implemented or under discussion in many OECD countries. We also published our report, Making the Green Recovery Work for Jobs, Income and Growth last month. Making um, a green recovery um, is a central part of stimulus packages to drive sustainable, inclusive, resilience, economic growth, and improve well being in the wake of the COVID 19 crisis in many OECD countries. And indeed, what we have seen is that OECD member governments have already committed themselves to over $312 billion of public resources to a green recovery. This is just a preliminary estimate, and we know that these numbers will be significantly growing um, with time. The analysis finds that among OECD and other major economies, a majority of countries have included measures directed at supporting the transition to greener economies in the recovery strategies, and that is really great to see. COVID-19 has seen an acceleration of thinking and ideas about how we rebuild our economies, addressing climate change, the rise of digital technologies and artificial intelligence, and what all of this means for jobs and skills for the future of work. These are vital issues and challenges that we all face together. There is much that nations can learn through the sharing of new research and ideas and working with international institutions as countries move forward. At the OECD and at the International Transport Forum at the OECD, we will be creating a dialogue um, among our members, and I hope that you will be part of that dialogue uh, going forward. 
And we also hope that our research and recommendations can contribute to your thinking as you develop strategic plans nationally and locally for responding to the COVID pandemic and for how we plan for inclusive growth to fuel our glo global recovery and build a sustainable future for all. Thank you. Yagoda, thank you so much indeed. It's really interesting, isn't it, that, as you say, COVID-19 has accelerated the green revolution. It's interesting to hear how much has already been committed in funding by OECD countries, because I know within the BBC we were talking about whether it would set back the sort of moves to a, a low carbon society. And in fact, maybe we are seeing evidence that in fact it has accelerated us in that direction. And, and certainly your statistics would bear that out. So fascinating to hear that. And thank you for being with us today from Paris, somewhere I, I really miss having <laughs> spent some time in Paris. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, Seema, I want to add my congratulations as a chair to you and everyone involved. I know it's only the start of the conversation, this, and the challenges, as, as David Blanket was saying, are huge, but it's really important to hear some of that optimism today. Uh, and you know what? After months of really grim news, it's been pretty uplifting to hear all the contributions this afternoon and all the ideas that are flowing. So maybe you could give us your final thoughts and tell us where it goes from here. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Christian. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Yes. Fantastic. Look, first, I want to say a thank you to Yagoja because I did feel it was a very thought provoking closing keynote and contribution to our conference today. And I must say it's also fantastic to see a woman leading aviation policy research at the OECD International Transport Forum. And indeed, as we look to our leadership internationally and nationally and how we can learn from the best and with the best, the OECD, with its work on aviation and also the green economy, I believe will be highly valuable for us to draw on. Now, you mentioned, Christian, that we are coming to the end of the conference. Uh, it's incredible how it's flown by. And I do want to, on behalf of Andrew Dakers and myself, just thank everybody who's joined us today, whether that's as speakers or as participants, because I do believe it's been an incredibly powerful event and an example of collaboration in practice. I also want to thank those who made this conference happen, our steering group, the US advisors, uh, West London Business, Andrew, Amelia and team, White Label Creative, Bonnie, Julie and team for their incredible care and patience. Because when we set out to create this conference, we did set out to inspire, to think differently about how we could create something new, to create a plan that could also transform opportunity and our place here in West London, uh, leveraging the extraordinary infrastructure that we have and the talent and existing innovators from Fujitsu to, to Magway. And to keep that focus on upskilling our people and our businesses and the focus on opportunity for all. It's really important that we continue to build those connections, uh, that this isn't a one-off and that we keep bringing together a stronger network of people as we do reimagine the future of West London as a place that we want to see universally recognized for transportation innovation, the engine of a greener future. And today is just one step in helping enable that vision of a green economic powerhouse. I also do want to thank Matt and Toby from Plus X and CRL in Hayes, who will be incubating the innovation district, effectively giving it a physical home. And already over 30 senior leaders have signed up just before the conference to be part of our steering network from academics and universities to businesses, local authorities, politicians, and indeed schools. It gives me that great confidence that working together that we can and we will make our vision a reality. And it comes back to the question about why we must do so, because we know that thousands of people and future generations are gonna depend on the choices we make today for their futures and how we plan for sustainable growth. We want everybody to stay part of this. So if you haven't already done so, sign up to the policy statement on the Miro Digital Whiteboard or get in touch with the conference team. If you're willing to be in, keep in touch with us, those who have been attendees today, certainly you'll be getting the post-conference materials and that will give you information as well about how you can stay involved. Together, I firmly believe 
that we can lead the way in the future in the world on the future of aviation and transportation. So let's grasp the opportunities that the new partnerships can bring and change our place and change the world for the better. Thank you. Uh, it just left for me to say thank you. Thank you to Seema. Thank you all to all our participants and attendees today for joining us. As I said at the outset, we have set some time aside for networking, and I really hope you will take that opportunity to meet and discuss with others some of these valuable ideas and contributions that we've raised today. Uh, so if you signed up for that, we look forward to seeing you in the wider networking group shortly, our sort of virtual drinks, if you will. Uh, thank you to all involved in making the conference such a great success. Have a safe and very enjoyable weekend. Thank you.